This man is a UN Women He For She champion. He's also co-founder of ECF, which is Equal Community Foundation. That's an award-winning social enterprise. Please meet Will Moore. Welcome, Will. Can I use this? Is this yes. for... Two hundred and thirty million. Two hundred and thirty million boys. Two hundred and thirty million boys in India under the age of eighteen. That's about ten times the population of Sweden. That's a lot of boys. I'd like to introduce you to one of those boys. This is Abhishek. He's a friend of mine. He's only 16. And like many 16-year-old boys, he goes to school. He likes to play cricket. He likes to hang out with his friends. But Abhishek actually has a problem. That problem is that for the last 16 years, Abhishek has been learning attitudes and behaviors that discriminate against women and affect his own well-being. For 16 years, Abhishek has been given messages, messages that discriminate against women and girls he's received those messages from his father, from his mother, from his aunts, his uncles, from his neighbors, from the community, from the media, from magazines, from films, from the internet. And when he looks around his community and in the city, Pune, where he lives, he sees that men are in positions of power and making decisions. They're running the institutions. And so he thinks the messages he's had are quite normal. But those attitudes that he's been building over the last 16 years are a real problem. But they're not actually Abhishek's problem. They are, in fact, our problem. Because Abhishek is a child. He's 16 years old. And it's the way that we, as adults, and society have been raising boys like Abhishek that have led to boys like Abhishek developing these attitudes and behaviors. One hundred and sixteen million, one hundred and sixteen million boys out of that two hundred and thirty who will grow up and be physically violent towards women. Fifty-eight million out of 230 million who will be sexually violent towards women, including rape. This is, this is really an epidemic. This is an epidemic that is unfolding in front of our eyes in countries like India, but in other countries too, including where I grew up in Scotland. But it's an epidemic that hasn't yet happened. It hasn't yet unfolded. But there are about 115, sorry, there are about 15 million boys every year who turn 18. And as they enter into relationships, as they get married, as they start to have families and households, and as they earn money, they begin to make decisions about how that money is spent and who does what in the household, and those attitudes, those attitudes play out, and they end up discriminating against women. My name's Will Muir, and I'm the co-founder of Equal Community Foundation. And 10 years ago, I learned about this problem. I was a consultant working in London, and that consultancy took me to India and in 2008, the global financial meltdown, 
meant that my job was redundant. And rather than return to London, I decided to take a package and set up a business in India. And what I set up was a cinema business, a community cinema business, that was designed to gather boys from communities, and um, not just boys, sorry, it was designed to gather communities, and it was designed to use cinema as a tool for doing that. And whilst we were showing them films, we would also be able to signpost them to social services so that they could increase and improve their education, increase and improve their health, and get better jobs so that they could further their lives. I set up a number of cinemas, and you'll be amused to know that they didn't actually work. They were a financial disaster, in fact. But I did end up with cinemas full of young boys who were the only people who came. And they couldn't afford to buy a ticket. And their dads weren't coming because the dads were at work. The mums weren't coming because they were also working in the house. And their sisters weren't allowed to come because girls aren't allowed to leave the house unless it's for school or to go out with a relative. So there I am in Pune with cinemas full of boys bouncing off the walls watching films. And in order to honor my commitment, I rang up the good and the great of the philanthropic world in India and all the people I knew who were working in social work. And I asked them, I said, I've got a room full of boys and I'm committed to doing some social work with them. What should I do? They all said, you're crackers, you're crazy, you're bonkers, you're balmy, you're loony. Don't work with boys. They said, come and work with us, we're working with girls. My consulting hat came on, and I said, well, that's fine. Why are you working with girls? And the answer, they said, girls face violence and discrimination. We've got to help them. We've got to help them move up the ladder. We've got to improve their health, their education. We've got to make sure that they can get jobs so that they're financially independent. And these are all extremely important outcomes. But with my, with my consulting hat on, I continue to ask, but why? Why do girls face violence and discrimination? People looked a little bit blank, and they said, well, society. Society discriminates against women and girls. And it was about this time that I think Steve Bannon said the only useful thing in his career, which was that people are the unit of society or culture. And it became clear to me that if boys and men who largely control resources and institutions, if they're making decisions that affect the way society discriminates against women and girls, that's a real problem. And I asked these social workers and philanthropists, I said, why aren't you working with boys and men? And they looked rather blankly. And when they thought about it, they said, yes, well, we'd like to work with boys and men, but actually, it's difficult. We don't know how to do it. Charities and nonprofits said, we don't really have the skills and we don't have the programs. And even if we did, we wouldn't get any funding for it. And so I realized that actually it wasn't the cinema that was the exciting bit of my work. It was the boys who were in the cinema. And to use an entrepreneurial term, we pivoted. So we stopped focusing on the cinema, and we started focusing on the boys. Because ultimately, when you look at the numbers, and you see that there are two, I'm just checking the time here, it's counting up. Thanks. So when you look at the numbers, and you see that there are 230 million boys, what you understand is that this is a problem that needs a big, large-scale solution. Now, this is what we learned. If you have 230 million boys in a country the size geographically of India, it is a problem that is too big and too diverse for, one e for any one organization to solve. It will require many programs delivered simultaneously to individual boys across the country. 
And that is something that one organization cannot solve. So our first response was to go out and speak to everybody. But as I said, they said, we don't have the programs to do it. We don't have the skills, and we don't have the resources. So we started to speak to funders. And they told us that they weren't able to support us because um, there wasn't a demand for this work yet. So we were really in a cyclical problem where we didn't have the tools to deliver the program. We couldn't build the evidence base to prove to policymakers and funders that this was a problem. But we had to start somewhere. And what we started with was a direct intervention. We started to build a program that engaged the boys who were coming to the cinema. We worked out using methods brought from academia what sort of program materials would change their attitudes over time to make sure their attitudes were gender equitable and nonviolent. And we built the tools that would actually show us how those attitudes were improving over time. I'm really confused with this clock, I'm really sorry. I think the bottom one is the time of day. And this 1908 is going down. But I thought I had 20 minutes, so it says I've got 19 left. OK. <laughs> I'm really sorry, I don't know. It, how much time have I got left to talk? 15 minutes. Oh, great. I'm really sorry, it was quite confusing. So we started to build a program. We started to draw on academics to understand what would work. And we started to build the tools that would allow us to measure progress. Because this is what we were told we would need. We would need programs, and we would need the evidence that our programs were working. And so that's what we did. And over the course of six years or so, we built a program. It's called Action for equality. It works with boys who are aged 13 to 16. And it changes their attitudes and their behaviors towards women and girls. This is what it looks like. Um, on the left, there is a scale. It shows here 0 to 2. Actually, the scale goes to 3. The higher the score, the more equitable the attitudes. And along the bottom, there are 10 questions that boys discuss. 10 questions in three themes. Violence and tolerance of violence, manhood and masculinity, and gender roles and responsibilities. The, the lines that you see show progress through our program. At T0, boys' attitudes are represented by the black line. And over the course of 45 weeks, the lines are represented through orange and green. Now, there's a few things that you can observe from this graph. The first thing is that we're being somewhat successful. The attitudes are improving over time from black to orange to green, they're actually improving, which is great. The second thing you'll see is that attitudes towards violence on the left are much more severe than they are towards, for example, gender roles on the right. What that means is that boys are more likely to think violence is OK, but they're also more likely to think that it's OK for a boy to help in the house, doing the hoovering, perhaps. The second thing you can, or the third thing you might notice, is that on the left, around violence, there's some confusion. It doesn't necessarily look like the attitudes are improving significantly over time. On the right, the, 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 the improvement is quite clear. But on the left, it's not so clear. And what that tells us is that it's harder to change these attitudes around violence particularly. The fifth thing you might notice is that 
Boys' attitudes when they enter the program are scoring an average of perhaps 0.7. And we're trying to get boys to a three. We're having some success. We're getting them to an average of perhaps 1.3. But we are still a long way from ensuring that boys are gender equitable and non-violent. This is after about half a million US dollars investment over 10 years. It's about 10 years of dedicated investment of very dedicated and clever people's time. And we haven't even begun to scratch the bottom. After the development of this program, we realized that we had a problem. We were unable, as a small organization, to build the programs needed to make boys like Abhijit gender equitable and nonviolent. We could do a bit of it, but we couldn't do all of it. And we could do it in one city, in a handful of communities, but we didn't have a chance of reaching out to 230 million boys. So we realized we had a problem. We were able to do some direct intervention, and it was working, it was pretty good. But if we wanted to reach 230 million boys, there wasn't a chance that we were gonna be able to do it unless we started working in a different way. And there are, th there are three ways that we've started working. The first is that we've started scaling our program, but not by doing it ourselves. We've been working with other organizations. We built a platform called Project Raise. It, it, it includes all the information that anybody needs to engage boys in three languages, English, Hindi, and Marathi, which is the local language where we work in India. This has allowed us to effectively double our outreach without any significant extra effort. We have about 240 partners on the platform who are learning these skills. But consistently, our partners told us that they had a problem. The reason they had a problem was that they couldn't find the resources to do this work, and often the materials we'd published were in a different language. So that made us realize actually we have um, another problem. We can't just scale through partnership if the resources don't exist for partners to implement and ad adapt our materials. And so we began to look at how we could develop further solutions. Now we get into this idea of system building. Unless there are systems and infrastructure in place that supports this idea of gender equitable boys, if those systems don't exist, it doesn't matter how well-meaning our partners are and how good they are and how important this issue is, they won't be able to deliver their work. What do the systems look like? Well, we've narrowed it down to four. The first is that there needs to be a, uh, an agreement, a system of agreement on what are we trying to achieve. What does it mean when a boy is gender equitable and non-violent at the age of 18? How would you measure it? What tools would you use to measure it? <laughs> if you can get people to agree on that outcome, you can build a group around it who are committed to it, who know that it's important if they're to succeed in their work. If you can gather such a coalition, and it's a specific coalition because it's an outcome-led coalition rather than a thematic coalition. A thematic coalition would be people who work in education, perhaps, or people who work in... Um, climate change, perhaps. But an outcome-led coalition is specifically working towards that singular agreed goal. If you can get those people to work together, then you can actually begin to lobby for specific policy change. And if you can get them to work together, they can actually start creating a national evidence base 
using existing tools to measure what are the existing attitudes and behaviors of boys in the communities where we work. And often that baseline data is useful for ensuring that you are successful in lobbying for policy change. So these are the four systems that we have identified need to exist before our partners are able to start implementing this. And it isn't until partners are able to start implementing this that, they, um, that we have a chance of working with these 230 million boys to prevent them growing up with attitudes and behaviors that are violent towards women. I think that we'd all agree the world is a big place and the issues that we face are extremely complicated. And Bill said it himself, they are becoming more complicated. It's not even clear if the resources available to solve these problems are increasing. And if they are increasing, certainly not in line with the complexity of the problems we face. So we have to think very carefully about what we're trying to solve. And we have to work together to solve it. Because there is no solution to these big, complex problems for one organization. It is only by working together and collaborating that we stand a chance of solving these. But given that the structures for collaboration exist, we do have an opportunity for large-scale impact. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation, Will. Um, now, you're talking here a little bit about, let's move out to the middle yes. of the stage. You don't yes. have a pillow for five. Uh, no, do we don't have a pillow for five, but maybe... Can I take another one? Another one. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Seven, so, so I'll choose this one. Great. So, Will, you were talking a bit here about um, structural systemic change. What is... Um, when you've developed your methods and when you've uh, done your thing, what are the biggest challenges that you have met during the way? You mentioned some of them, some of them, but the hardest thing has been being resilient over the time it takes to understand the issues to develop and test ideas, learn from your mistakes, readjust your program work, and to have the time to learn what the future looks like for your organization. The new program that we're launching, in fact, this month, is another 10 years of work. Mm. And it's about helping coalitions in other countries build these four structural changes in their country. Identifying the outcome, building coalitions who can deliver baseline evidence, and then use that to lobby for policy. So the hardest thing has actually been patient and making sure that the organization is able to sustain through these tumultuous changes. And when it comes to finance, we've been talking here about these days about the finance industry and how they have actually started to, to jump on this train. But it's, it could be difficult because the finance sector needs to measure in a very number way. Uh, you know, it's hard to measure complex uh, challenges like yours. And also this long-term thinking that you're talking about. These are changes that take long time and may be hard to measure. Well, you showed us how you measure it, but how do you look on, how do you see that? How do you finance, how do you explain to the people who finance the business? I'm not sure I agree with everything that was said about the way finance works. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the reality is that the issues and the solutions that we need are so far out of most people's imagination and field of view that 
it doesn't matter how good your story is, people would think you're completely crackers. And so um, there are two things that we do to ensure that we are financed. The first thing that we do is we keep our costs so low. Because the less money you need to raise, the fewer people you need to raise it from. And if your idea is completely crackers, there aren't very many people who will fund you. So as soon as your cost base grows, you inevitably end up having to compromise to pay for it. So the first thing we do is we keep our costs as absolutely low as possible. And the second thing that we do um, is that we learn very quickly who's really going to be interested in this. And if somebody's not interested, we say thank you and we move on very quickly. Okay. Because raising finance is a very time-consuming process. It is. Yeah, you can spend a lot of time in doing that. So, so looking ahead for uh, Equal Community Foundation, what do you see looking maybe five or ten years ahead? I see a growing recognition for the need to start engaging boys in gender equality issues. There is a recognition, of course, already. But I think that um, there's a lot of confusion as to how best to approach this. And there isn't a great deal of support for people who are trying to do it. Um, the second thing that I really hope will happen is that as this field of gender equality work with boys, as it grows, I hope that we are able to apply lessons learned from previous fields. Why did those fields take 10, 20, 30, 40 years to mature? What were the barriers that prevented them from maturing faster? And actually, the answer is that a lot of fields that have been developed over the last 20 or 30 years, per perhaps HIV AIDS, perhaps adolescent girl education, perhaps climate change, a lot of them have seen disparate efforts funded independently by foundations, all competing for a limited pot of money. And it wasn't until people started to identify common outcomes, for example, um, keeping CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases to a certain number of parts per million. That was a very clear common goal that was set. And what it allowed, what it allowed people to do was unite around that goal and um, share resources on how to achieve that goal. And that accelerated the pace at which we were able to build solutions. So I, I, I really hope that we're able to put some of those um, structural components in place sooner rather than later. Because if we do, we have the potential to um, accelerate the rate at which we can ensure we're working with every boy so that they're all gender equitable and mm. non-violent. So as an award-winning social entrepreneur and Ashoka Fellow, uh, what would your advice to these guys be if they also want to make a big impact, kind of systemic change? I think the first thing you need to do is you need to look after yourself and you need to make sure that you're happy and healthy and that you have enough money to survive. Um, I think the second thing that you need to do is you need to go and speak to lots of people. You don't need to listen to what they say and you can disregard a lot of it, but you need to speak to a lot of people. Um, the third thing that I would do is I would try and define the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Because it, without defining the outcome you're trying to achieve, it's very difficult to make decisions about where you should allocate resources or what program should you pursue next. And the final piece of advice I'd give you is to um, have a look at the Ashoka framework change, which looks at this model of direct intervention scaling your intervention through other people, but also ecosystem building and reframing. And remember that 
those things mean different things for different people. So one person's systemic change is not going to be the same as what you need to do for your work. So what did it mean to you to become an Ashoka Fellow? Um, I kept my sanity. Um, I was able to pay thing. my bills. Um, I was able to think about the issues that I was trying to solve more clearly because it provides framework and it prov frameworks which you've seen. It also provides spaces for you to work with other entrepreneurs. It provides access to um, resources. So I've just recently finished a great program with JP Morgan in Geneva. Um, they were helping me build this new program for ecosystem building and systemic change. Um, but I think probably most importantly, they're very patient, right? Most people will, you know, offer you help. They might come and volunteer for six months if you're lucky. They might give you a grant for a year, three years if you're lucky. Um, Ashoka's been with me for six years now, and they're not letting up. It's great to have this long-term commitment. Wilmur, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much.